Hi, Jody. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. It has been ages since I last see you. Oh, it has been too long. Too it's long. It's been almost the five years. Wow. <laughs> I'm sure I haven't aged. <laughs> so, um, how the Australians are coping with this COVID-19 scenario? Uh, so the Australian response has been um, pretty good by, I guess, by world standards. Um, we have been very lucky, very fortunate in some regards in that um, our community engaged with uh, lockdown uh, requirements very early on. Um, in fact, before the government actually put uh, restrictions on behaviours, we noticed uh, a decline in people going out and we, we saw people beginning to just social distance in those very early days. Um, we are also, I guess, fortunate, um, unlike a lot of other countries, that we are an island and so we can control our borders. Uh, we were able to shut down um, known ways of the disease coming into the country pretty quickly and we were able to track who was coming into the country um, basically you can find out who was on a plane very quickly and whether anyone was infected on that plane and therefore contract contact trace any other person on that plane uh, very quickly um, as opposed to so a border between Canada and the US with there's cars and everybody going everywhere um, so we were pretty lucky in both those regards. And I guess the final piece of luck that we had, um, Australia is a very big country. Um, it's hard to get your head around how big it is. And our population is spread out across Australia. So uh, for example, I, I live in the capital and we have about 400,000 people living here. At any one time, 50,000 of those are students, and so they weren't actually able to come into the country at that point. So, you know, our population is very small um, and very spread out, and therefore we don't actually come in close contact with a lot of people um, on a daily basis. Uh, so that stopped the spread of the, the disease. Um, so what do you think, how much the culture, the culture is playing the role in the spread of the COVID-19? You remember we used to read that course from the Dr. Graham, um, we used to talk about the qualitative research methodologies and how culture plays a role in the spread of any disease. So I think in the COVID-19 scenario, uh, the culture plays really important role, isn't it? I think you're right. And I think, um, so the culture and the way governance is structured in Australia. So um, Australia sort of sits in this murky middle of the road. And most of us sit somewhere between the left and the right. And then generally in this sort of little middle ground, and there's sort of the hard left and the hard right, but they're very few and far between. And so when the culture comes together to say, actually, we've got a problem here, and we need to do something about it, then you can get a critical mass pretty quickly. One of the other interesting parts of our culture is that we all come from somewhere else, either only one or two generations back. And so we all have a family relative who is sitting in another country that was exposed to the condition first. So if you look at Australia's demographics, we have the largest population of Greek people outside of Greece. And so, all of those people watched what was happening over in Greece and Italy and, and our Chinese population were watching happen in China. And then we, we saw what was happening and went, ah, oh, right, lock down the hatches. We know there's a problem here. We don't know what to do exactly, but we know that isolation is going to be part of the solution. Um, so our culture, um, we're relatively trusting of government. Mm -hmm. um, and you know if all governments come together and say this is the path then that's the path we take pretty much there's very little rebellion here <laughs> and i was thinking of late that um, as we all people are practicing the quarantine and the isolation um, there would be the chances that the prevalence of the mental health issue will uh, increase because once you start yes. isolating from the people there will yep. be the increase yep, yep. In, the, in the prevalence of the mental health issue and also probably the prevalence of the non-communicable diseases, um, especially in the countries like in the developing country, like in Pakistan, if you are in that isolation, you normally don't do the physical exercise or the physical activity. So there will be the chances that the obesity will increase and the CVD will increase. How, how you see that? 
Uh, that's a really good question. So I think there are, um, let's go to the non-communicable diseases. What we've found is that people, because in our isolation rules, you're allowed to exercise. So people are exercising or they're locked in their house. So we probably have seen a small spike in, in exercise, but what we have seen, and which is very concerning, is um, people not going to their general practitioner for their usual checkups. So their diabetes checkups or their heart checkups. Um, and we did see, um, which, you know, the health uh, community got onto pretty quickly, um, cancelling of some of the screening programs. Um, that was a great concern. So breast screen and cervical screening programs were all stopped. Um, those programs are obviously um, key to getting an early diagnosis and getting onto those diseases. Uh, so yeah, that's been a, a main concern. And we put out messaging to our community in particular to say, you've got to go to these meetings and you've got to go to this sessions with your doctor and you have to keep these things under check. Mental health, I think, has been um, under-recognised as an issue here, and I think it is going to be a significant issue. So if you take back to the global financial crisis, um, we found that there was a very large spike in mental health. Actually, I was... Um... ...issues, particularly for those people who lost their jobs and were never able to get those back. Mm. I was reading an article saying that since we um, put that isolation in practice, there was an increase in the domestic violence, about 12% globally. So that is another issue we need to look at because there will be the increase of the um, alcohol abuse or the cigarette abuse and the other, other non-healthy practices. And these practices lead to that kind of the incidences, isn't it? Yes, I would imagine so. Um, domestic violence is not my area of specialty, to be honest. But um, if you can imagine, if there's no other outlet for a person and they're frustrated and they've lost their job and they're stressed, and this is the way they cope is to purport domestic violence or, you know, be violent towards another person, and they're locked in the house with someone, that is what is going to happen. Um, so... Um, I know the government has put in extra domestic violence counselling and services, mm -hmm. but um, we would want to see many more places that people actually go to. So we know people are being turned away from refugee, refugees and things like that at the moment, which is very concerning. Um, okay, um, and the million dollar question, what is your take on that uh, vaccination thing? Everyone is talking about that vaccination will come. Every day I, I look at the internet and I see they are like, this medicine is going on, this vaccination is going on. My take is like, probably we won't um, have the vaccination till 2021 or till 2022. Yeah, I'd be pretty happy if we had something by 2022. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see whether we actually develop herd immunity before a vaccine. There you go. That's my, <laughs> because it, it, we don't know how many people have it. So there's this group of people who run through society who have been exposed to COVID and may never even know yeah. um, because we didn't test everybody because you can't. Um, and some people had such mild symptoms, they may never have known they even were exposed to the disease. So did they develop a, an immunity or not? And then, you know, what, what happens as it slowly, you know, peaks and rises and peaks and falls as it will over the next course of the next year. Yeah. I always give that example that uh, since 1980s, we are claiming that we will make the vaccination for HIV, but we could not able to, except for the few retroviral drugs, we could not able to make anything. Probably that will be the case with the coronavirus as well. Um, well, I don't think we've, been, I don't think we've found a, a vaccine for any of the coronas yet. So um, this is true. And, um, and we did have one professor saying that we really should be investing in rather than vaccine research, but research to treat. So, you know, if you get it, you live rather than all the other complications we're getting with it. And so, another topic that is, that should... yeah, another topic that is like under discussion is the concept of the herd immunity. Um, if you develop that herd immunity, probably that is the only way to protect your community from the uh, COVID-19. What's your take on that? Yeah. Um, without a vaccine, then herd immunity is your only option, isn't it? Um, if you don't have a vaccine and you don't have a treatment, then herd immunity is the last option. Um, I think society can remain locked down for a little while, um, but I've really, you know, 
everyone has noticed the mental health of people in the household deteriorating, um, particularly younger people. Um, and there's only so long you can run an economy like this. Uh, so there's going to have to be a trade-off at some point in time here. Yeah, but, but the problem with the developing countries is like in Pakistan, we could not practice the quarantine for the longer period of the time because the poverty is like really high over there in Pakistan. So people need to go out and, and um, earn their living. So that is the problem. That's mm -hmm. why I think yesterday the government has just uh, smoothened that lockdown thing. A lot of people were on the road. And um, uh, I assume that uh, probably we will have about 50, 60,000 cases in, in the next 20, 30 days, the way it's going on. Yeah, with it's very sad. Thousand cases. Yeah, yeah um, it's, a, it's a really awful situation to be in where you're basically choosing, you're choosing between two very evil things. You know, do people not earn an income and therefore can't exist or do they expose themselves to a disease and therefore can't exist it's these aren't uh that's not a decision i would like to make <laughs> okay last question um and then we will finish that uh, where do you see the world in the next say six months or at the end of the 2020 end of 2020 i think we'll still be in a fair amount of lockdown to be honest um it I guess um, Europe might open up its borders to each other. There might be these little cliques. Mm -hmm. So I know Australia and New Zealand are thinking of opening up borders. And I know Australia is thinking of developing some way of actually having a quarantine system so we can let people into the country who plan to stay here for say a degree, like as students, they can quarantine and then move back into Australia. So some sort of quarantining effort, which is something we can do because we're just so big we can sort of just hive off of a small island off the coast there and <laughs> stick everyone on it but um it's not an option available to every country um so um there's just going to be pockets of people who move in different ways and it'll be very interesting to see uh who's where by the end of 2020 i think australia and new zealand will be in their own little bubble lockdown still um possibly with some ways of getting in but uh but it won't be sort of mass travel that's for sure okay thank you thanks for your time it has been such a lovely conversation with you and i hope that the people will take the message from here ah thank you very much lovely to speak to you and let's not let a disease be the reason we talk next time <laughs> see ya bye bye